Attorney Moore, uh, what would you tell a Russian billionaire about how long they're going to have to wait to get their yachts back or if they're ever getting their yachts back? Well, I think it's going to be a process. I think the the long arm of the Department of Justice of the United States uh, does have global reach. And uh, once uh, arrested or seized, uh, depending on which procedure is used, it will be a process. It will take some time. And what happens to the to these boats now? They need massive crews and daily maintenance all over the vessel. Uh, what happens now when when they've been seized? Well, it's, it's a it's a good question because, as you you correctly stated, the, they do need care and feeding. They need lots of attention, lots of things that a yacht require, like maintenance, dockage, insurance, uh, crew, things that keep them up and running. Uh, they are uh, movable assets, but as you stated in your introduction, they, you can't really hide these vessels. They, they, you can see them from, um, you know, computer-generated systems that identify their location. Also, every port in the world uh, it keeps a record of what, what yachts enter and leave. So um, they, are, they will really have nowhere to run to, nowhere to hide. Uh, once seized by the United States uh, government, you, in, in cooperation in many cases with the governments of the waters that they are in, uh, like uh, Jolo, this uh, Malaysian development fund uh, owner of a yacht called Equanimity, you know, you have the local uh, governments that cooperate with the United States and vice versa to seize these assets. And, uh, you know, when they tow our cars, they can just leave them in the tow lot until we get there. And the worst that's going to happen is that you'll be some dirt right. on them. Cars don't need anything. Uh, I mean, they, these things are like infant babies. I mean, if they are ignored they are. Uh, on the dock, that means they are not just uh, depreciating. They are deteriorating significantly if they're not getting all of that daily maintenance. Right. That's right. They're, they're hemorrhaging money. Uh, this is true. Uh, you, you, of every yacht that you mentioned, that you, you would have to be a billionaire to own those yachts. So the, the cost of carry is staggering. It's seven hundred fifty thousand a month to a million dollars a month. It's not unusual. Um, and uh, as you stated, it's a, it's a constant care and feeding uh, to keep them from deteriorating. And they, and they do de deteriorate rapidly. They're in very hostile environments. So saltwater environments, a hot, inherently hostile environment. And uh, if the crew is not, uh, the crew is, these are working people. They may not even fully understand who uh, owns the yacht, who's the beneficial owner. So the crew uh, will literally be in the dark on that issue. And so they would just do their job until they're not paid. And at that point, they will have to make other arrangements. And once again today, the United States and NATO officials refuse to consider sending combat planes into the air over Ukraine to shoot down Russian planes. The Secretary General of NATO said this. We are not part of this conflict. And we have a responsibility to ensure it does not escalate and spread beyond Ukraine. Because that would be even more devastating and more dangerous with even more human suffering. NATO is not seeking a war with Russia. Allies agree that uh, we should not have uh, NATO planes operating over Ukrainian airspace or NATO troops on uh, uh, Ukrainian territory. Today, Secretary of State Antony Blinken said this. The only way to actually implement something like a no-fly zone uh, is to send NATO planes into Ukrainian airspace and to shoot down Russian planes. And that uh, could lead to a full-fledged war um, in, uh, in Europe. President Biden has been clear that we uh, are not going to get into a war with Russia. But we are uh, going to tremendous lengths with allies and partners to provide Ukrainians with uh, the means to, uh, to effectively defend themselves. And of course, we're seeing every single day their extraordinary heroism, uh, as well as um, very, uh, very real results in, um, in what they're doing to, to achieve that. And then President Zelensky said this.
We believe that NATO countries have created a narrative that closing the skies over Ukraine would provoke Russia's direct aggression against NATO. This is the self-hypnosis of those who are weak, insecure inside, despite the fact that they possess weapons many times stronger than we have. President Zelensky is the bravest president that we have ever seen on television in the middle of a war. But he also has far less experience in measuring NATO's response to Russian aggression to avoid nuclear war with Russia, something NATO has been doing for decades. The only way to enforce a so-called no-fly zone is to make it a war zone. The phrase no-fly zone as is being used this week, is a euphemism for shooting down Russian planes. If the United States shoots down Russian planes and Russia shoots down American planes, no one knows how to prevent that from turning into an all-out war between not just Russia and the United States, but Russia and every member country of NATO. Because every member country of NATO would be obligated to come to the defense of the United States when our planes are shot down. And so Vladimir Putin could be immediately firing missiles all over Europe as well as at the United States. And if Vladimir Putin decides to go nuclear in his response because he's decided he has nothing to lose, you won't recognize London or Paris or Rome after that. You won't recognize New York or Washington, D.C. Of course, Moscow and Vladimir Putin would not exist after a nuclear exchange, but no one would feel like they won. The people left alive would experience nothing but loss, the greatest loss in human history. Every president of the United States during the Cold War has stared into that abyss every time a Russian dictator rolled tanks into another country. And every Cold War president, including General Dwight Eisenhower, who won World War II in Europe as the commanding general of Allied forces, decided that as painful as it was to watch Russian aggression and cruelty, and in many cases mass murder, as Russia is doing now in Ukraine, the only thing that could make it all much, much worse would be for the United States to get in a shooting war with Russia that could lead to mutually assured destruction in an exchange of nuclear weapons. If the United States tripped into nuclear war with Russia, the Russian nuclear weapons would hit Ukraine and wipe out everyone in that country before the Russian nuclear weapons reached the United States. It would happen so fast in Ukraine that Ukrainians wouldn't even know that the nuclear strike was coming. We would know. We would have maybe a 15-minute warning. Or, as in the brilliant movie Failsafe, which everyone should watch again now, the president might not warn us that the missiles are coming in order to spare us the most intense panic of our lives in our final minutes. No president of the United States has ever had a menu of good choices in dealing with Russian aggression and war making. And no president has ever made the choice to send pilots into air combat against Russian pilots in the middle of a hot war. And so, so far, no one who is urging President Biden to do that has explained how we can be certain that the most unpredictable Russian leader of the nuclear age would not go nuclear. Andre, what is the, the situation there and, and how, is, how are people managing with the basics of life, uh, food, for example, uh, and finding shelter that they can feel safe in? Well, as far as shelter is concerned, I'm talking to you from my bathroom. 
which is the safest place in my flat because it has an additional wall. And I cannot go to a shelter, to a bomb shelter now, because otherwise I won't be able to join you. As far as food and amenities are concerned, in many cities they are normal or almost normal. And for instance, in Kiev, you can still go to a supermarket and buy everything you have provided uh, and everything you need, provided you have en enough money on your card. There's, of course, a problem with uh, cash and many smaller stores do not offer anything on card, but so far it's been OK. In my flat in the uh, district where I live, I had one day without heating because there was an explosion which damaged the heating system. But uh, gas and electricity have been so far on the constant supply. There is it is absolutely other situation in some other cities like Mariupol next to the front line in the south of Ukraine where people haven't had hadn't had uh, their amenities for two and a half days now and Ukraine is a rather big country in European terms so it depends on where you are again with the Bombings and artillery shooting and rocket shooting is different. 800 meters from where I live, a high rise was hit by a rocket something like three or four days ago. Then there were at least two gun battles there. And uh, But people in other districts of Kiev are in a very much worse position. Uh, is there a pattern to the attacks? Is there a time of day where you feel safer? Well, of course, when the dawn breaks and it's uh, light out of the window, then it is somehow psychologically better. But um, again, when the, during the first two or three days, they used to attack at around three or four o'clock our time. Then they... Um, to uh, one day, they started at approximately midnight. And at the moment, they, uh, at least in Kiev, they make a lull from midnight to six or seven in the morning. Well, civilians cannot predict this, I believe. Probably the military knows something about the pattern. And we have reports of over a million uh, refugees leaving the country. It's a it, it's a country of 44 million people. Uh, is is everyone leaving who can leave or do many more people want to leave who cannot leave? Again, some people want to leave, but they have no means to get to the border. Some people can leave, but they stay behind to protect their country. I know people of both persuasions, and um, it's nothing no surprise. People are different in every country. As far as 44 million is concerned, this is the official and rather imaginary number, because for quite some time, lo lots of Ukrainians were working abroad. Some of them have returned after the uh, active phase of the war started, but. Uh, by our estimates, uh, the population has been 38, 39 million people with four to five million people living and working abroad. This does not mean, of course, that these are uh, that four million or five million people away makes us less important, at least for ourselves.